So t- today's uh, uh, the topic is um, the deep learning. Uh, so this is 2160, uh, lecture 21, deep learning, CNN, and RNN. Okay. Um, let me start with a quick uh, recap. And so the last time <clears throat> uh, we discussed the uh, um, you know the neural network, and then you know starting with the basic uh, neural model, and we draw half a stochastic gradient to descent method that's laid out uh, some of the uh, you know theoretical foundations uh, for um, neural net training. Um, which is very much a stochastic, but uh, and then the theory is very um, limited to, to a very idealized case. Um, there are many uh, extensions that are being made, but uh, um, yeah, it is actually still a big gap between the, um, the um, more practical neural nets versus the something that mathematically analyzable. <clears throat> but but it, it, it set this on the foundation, so we know what we are really doing. Then we look at the nonlinear classification, exclusive or problem as a uh, counterexample for simple the limitations and of the simple neural net. And, and then that is to lead to a neural uh, and a multi layer neural net. And then we look at the error back propagation algorithms. And then we discuss a few items uh, like uh, output to functions, uh, sigmoid function has uh, interesting properties. And uh, a momentum uh, term for smoothing, the um, <clears throat> um, otherwise a zigzag uh, uh, optimization program. And then we address the local minima issues and the mini batch training, and then uh, end up with the hyperparameters. So this is actually a uh, big, big area. So the um, one of the highlight of the last uh, um, class is very basically um, error back propagation algorithms, and uh, it, it has a beautiful structure for the pass uh, moving from um, input to uh, output, and based on the, the simple two equations, uh, first the each unit to collect the inputs x uh, with the weights, weighted the sum, and then create the, an output through uh, this nonlinear map such as the sigmoid function. After arriving at the um, output, <coughs> it is compared to the um, teacher signals and error is back propagated. Error is basically delta. And then on the delta is first defined at the final layer, which is actually um, exposed to, actually uh, compared to uh, uh, correct the signals directly. But after that, we have to propagate this one backwards. And it turns out that the structure of back propagation algorithms is very, very similar to forward pass, where you can see this one weighted sum of incoming signals Xi, and here weighted the sum um, weighted by this weights WKJ. We collect the delta, basically error is basically input to this backward uh, computation. We collect all the, the deltas, errors uh, with this weight, and then this weighted the, the sum is basically mapped to uh, the next delta. But uh, instead of having this nonlinear functions, evaluate this at this point, but instead uh, we multiply multiply the uh, gradient, uh, excuse me, um, derivatives of this output function evaluated at that um, particular values of uh, z. <coughs> So, yeah, you know, the, this, this is what we have learned. Uh, so today's the topic, we go to a little bit in you know, the deep learning side. And then we started with the somewhat, uh, you know, um, uh, key uh, issues, uh, which we did not discuss the last time, some training of a multi-layer neural net, and overfitting and the validations of training. And then the gradient vanishing problem, which is very important, that actually leads to uh, deep neural nets. We first uh, look at the um, convolutional neural network or CNN. And then actually, the second part is a recurrent neural network and RNN. Um, so, CNN, uh, there are many things involved, but I know we just focus on the few important concepts. Uh, uh, focused connections, so we do not actually fully connect the, all the uh, neurons, but then we focus on that and then create a hierarch- hierarchical structure. And then, um, you know, one of the very important uh, the point is automatic feature extractions and then abstraction via pooling. 
um, RNN, um, we, this, this may be more relevant to what 2160 main theme, dealing with the time series data processing. And uh, we have to apply the back propagation in a little bit uh, um, modified uh, manner, and it's called the back propagation through time, BPTT. And uh, uh, long short term memory, LSTM, perhaps this one will be is the most prevailing method. And then we, we basically um, benefit from this technology um, in, in many uh, activities we do with the computer. So that's actually the things so that we'd like to cover today. So um, let's start with the issues of multi-layer neural nets. Let's fix it a little bit. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, multi-layer neural nets, and we discussed the local minima issues and then software, you know, slow convergence issue, but I you know one critical issue is actually overfitting. So let's look at this. Overfitting, as you know, um, you know, um, yeah, you know, uh, as shown here, uh, this, the, the many of the data points in here, uh, all these show the same data points, but I you know depending on the, what the sort of a curve you uh, fit to the data, uh, it's all different, right? The simplest one is straight around here. This is a little underfitting. And this one is chasing the, some little bumps over here. It's a, an obviously overfitting situation. And this may be a proper um, granularity, proper accuracy, uh, considering the, the magnitude of the noise and so forth. Some visible trend like, like this. Overfitting is a fundamental problem in all areas of system identifications. Um, and the data-driven system modeling. So it's very uh, central issues in 2160. Unfortunately, we do not have a very um, powerful theories um, other than the one that, that is called Akaike's Information Criterion, AIC. This is the one that I taught uh, uh, up to about five years ago, and then uh, um, we replaced it by some other new materials. Um, but but this one is actually the one very well known theory uh, telling us uh, what is a reasonable system mod order or system complexity level and given some data set having some noise and some you know, inconsistency um, uncertainties in it. Akaike's uh, <clears throat> information criterion it's an uh, information theoretic method that, that tells us exactly, you know, what is the order of the system. But maybe this is a usable for tuning the some, you know, transfer functions and so forth. Um, but as a store, it is actually applicable um, only to a large data, large number of data, n is extremely large, uh, like a symptotic variance uh, analysis. Uh, um, you know, central limit to theorem, but that this particular one is to tell us, um, looking at the uh, evaluating the data and then tell us what is the levels of complexity and uh, the system can provide. No other theoretical method is available. So uh, how to tune the systems, it's very much empirical judgment that the engineer has to make. However, one uh, you know, method to which I like to share with you, and then I hope you can use this for your uh, current COP number four neural nets. So that's a validation of learned model, identified model. <laughs> so neural net can be trained for a set of training data, but it may not work for new data, right? So how can we validate a trained neural net, whether it works well for data not involved in the training data. So the typically what you do is this is to show the entire the data set. Actually, I showed the, this blue one's input and this is the green one's in the output, whatever. So you have so many you know, data points. However, don't use all of them uh, for training the neural net, rather retain some fractions of the data for validation meaning that they train this one with this data and they use these for testing. So, you know, um, typically what I do, um, you know, in, in any subject I, I, I've been teaching is that uh, I give some homework assignments like this, but uh, I retain some uh, good programs for midterm exam. 
So students uh, learn things, you know, train themselves with this, you know, homework assignments, right? Um, but we don't know whether they really understand it well, all right? So we give the midterm exam and, you know, these problems should not to be too much a surprise, but are somewhat different from this. So whether they, they can really actually, you know, um, understand the materials and uh, you know, solve the, um, you know, a little bit of different problems involved here. So, so we use this validation data for evaluating the training, you know. Um, so it is interesting to see this. Uh, so, you know, you uh, set aside these uh, validation data, right? And train this. And then um, as you repeat the, uh, on the training, you present the sequence of uh, input, um, the data, right? And then compare that one against the, the correct output, right? And then, well, no, if we have a capital N data showing the all the end data, that's, that's one epoch, right? And we we repeat that the epoch. And so this, this basically training iteration is the number of epochs um, you present to the systems. As you train them more and more, um, initially it goes and the error, uh, squared error um, goes down very quickly, right? And then actually, you know, um, going to some kind of bent over here and it's still going down, down, down. However, uh, don't forget to test it uh, with respect to the validation data. Validation data is usually worse than the, um, you know, um, uh, the um, you know, performance is worse than the uh, training data, right? Because the neural net is trained to fit the, um, this training data, right? Oops. However, um, validation data is actually going down as well um, as, as, as far as it is um, learning something, you know, um, properly. However, um, somewhere here, um, this validation error would not actually, uh, you know, decrease. Rather, it is gradually increasing. So this is the important point. So, you know, here it is to fit the, uh, this data almost, uh, you know, chasing you know, all the details, right? This one is basically overfitting situation, overfitting situation. If the neural net chases such a noise, it, it is bad. And then in fact, uh, you know, tested with the validation data, um, it gets worse, worse, you know, at this point. So this is a, not the meaningful, you know, uh, the learning, you have to stop uh, training at the right point to somewhere here. So, you know, this is a way to uh, detect the, um, you know, um, overfitting situations and uh, we stop a training at that point. Now, please uh, try this, you know, with your, um, for your COP number four. Um, I think Charlie asked me, you know, uh, he tried to use a more, um, you know, a hidden layers. Actually, I suggested only one, you know, hidden layers, but he tried many, you know, hidden layers. We, he said, I, I got a much better result. You know, <laughs> is this okay to do? You know, yeah, go ahead and then try it. But don't forget to uh, um, validate it uh, using uh, some data, which you set aside, okay? So how many hidden units to use? This is always in the bigger questions. And when we do a multi-layer neural net, um, in a conventional wisdom and the early days of neural nets and prefer small uh, networks because the fewer parameters uh, will be less likely to overfit. That, that's correct, right? Well, in fact, what we learned and the system identifications uh, or, or just, you know, um, theory is applied to for only a linear systems. Um, a symptomatic uh, variance analysis, for instance, you know, um, tells us that they don't put the don't don't over parameterize the systems, right? So that, that's actually equivalent to say that they, you know, and don't put too much actually, you know, neural nets or hidden layers. Um, but you know, uh, the theory said that that is uh, actually only for limited class of system, in particular linear, linear systems. In the nonlinear domain, it's a little bit different situations. And uh, somewhat the more recent wisdom is that uh, if early stopping is used, the large networks are it's, uh, behaving great. 
Um, and in fact, uh, in many cases, um, you know, large networks often behave, behaves as if they have a fewer effective uh, hidden units. They will not actually wake up uh, um, other uh, units, um, but uh, do some uh, proper fitting with those uh, um, active uh, uh, neural uh, units. And the end result is better because you have a bigger big opportunity to uh, fit, so it's better. So shown here is actually validation test the error against the several, uh, against the, uh, the training epochs. And you know, one is with only four um, you know, uh, hidden units, and this one is 15 you know, hidden units, this are just you know, three layer neural net. And uh, um, having more hidden units actually provide the better results. Um, uh, although you have to stop uh, the training at, at a certain point over here, and otherwise actually adverse effect comes out. So, you know, that's one way of uh, avoiding the overfitting. Another way, which is a little bit, you know, um, um, you know, brute force, but a data augmentation. If you have more data, surely, you know, um, you know, neural nets can't fit the, all the data points. And so um, it is to approximate in, in some nice way. So, you know, um, yeah, this, you know, if you have more data, uh, training data, it's good, right? And also improving the robustness too. And, and then actually, uh, some of the physical experiments, if you want to uh, fit the data to uh, uh, fit the neural nets to uh, expand some experimental data, maybe it is limited uh, to get the, the number of you know, uh, data points. Uh, so uh, people include some simulations or some kind of artificially created the data points. So turn one positive or negative example into many positive example. Uh, it's called the prolification. For instance, here's the one dog, and then actually, you know, image processing, you know, situations. Um, we create the data by moving the, you know, doggy, you know, different points or rotate. Uh, this is actually upside down. Mm, whether this one is useful or not, I'm not sure. But you know, uh, you can create many data coming out of uh, one data, um, right? So image data, rotate the rescale or shift the image or flip the image about the axis. Um, you know, uh, image still contains the same object, exhibit the same you know, event or actions. But if we use this, you know, um, if you have a fewer points, uh, it tends to overfit, but you know, if you have more data points, you know, you can't actually chase all the points. So typically it is to, uh, you know, um, obtain, it is, uh, allow us to um, get the better results. Okay, now let's go to uh, you know main topic today. That's actually deep learning, and uh, um, well, deep or shallow is an actually you know important uh, architectural um, issue. You know what I mean by deep is that we have so many uh, many many hidden units. So extend the neural nets in this direction. The shallow uh, neural net means that uh, um, typically we have only a three layer neural net having one hidden unit, but I know we include the many, many increase the number of hidden units over here, right? So uh, as I showed in the previously, as you have more hidden units, it's better in performance typically, right? So, you know, which one is actually better and then which one we should pursue? Um, and here's the one, uh, you know, theoretical point and we need to understand, we need to uh, look at. One is actually, you know, universal functional approximation theory. So three layer neural network, okay, with, with the, I, I, you know, um, sigmoid output of functions having this, okay. Um, it satisfies the uh, um, functional approximation theorem, right? So three-layer neural network is a universal approximation function that can approximate an arbitrary, basically measurable function to any accuracy. So you specify any small positive number epsilon. There exists a finite number of neural uh, units M such that the um, error um, is bounded by epsilon. So um, even three layers is just to find why you care 
um, deep neural nets extending this one in this direction. Yeah, you know, uh, the one, the two important points is that, uh, first of all, the deep neural net, this, this deep one, has fewer weights to tune than shallow wide um, networks to represent the same uh, you know, functions. Um, so if you just look at the number of uh, um, units versus the number of uh, connections, um, let's say that these two wide and uh, you know, deep, shallow and the deep ones, um, having the same number of uh, um, you know, the hidden, hidden units. And the question is, which one having more weights to tune? Yeah, in fact, uh, this guy, um, you know, shadow one has much more units, uh, much, much more weights, parameters to tune. Excuse me. So, um, yeah, you know, um, in, in terms of the uh, tuning uh, no performance, you know, um, the deep neural net is better in that sense. And also the deep neural net having a more structured like this, uh, no, you know, opens up uh, the many, uh, you know, uh, different architecture. So we, we can actually enjoy the flexibility of the architecture and the algorithms. So the deep neural net is uh, actually the, um, being studied the most extensively um, in the last uh, 20 years or so. So this is still hypothesis. It is a debatable hypothesis. The more hidden layers on a multi-neural net that has, the better the, um, it represents a highly nonlinear relationship. But we did look at the um, an exclusive or problem to begin with, right? That is to create the internal representation uh, of the inputs. Um, and that is to create the yet another internal state uh, that allows to make the final layer to make the right uh, decisions. So, yeah, you know, that's actually a good thing to, to have a more hidden uh, layer, the hidden units. However, the, there are a few uh, obstacles to go over. One is that uh, the problem known as gradient vanishing problem. This is the major roadblock and going to a deep neural net. So error does not propagate the deep into early uh, layers. So um, error back propagation starting with the uh, final layers and then we create the kind of an error, right? And then that error, delta is back, back propagated. But uh, let's look at the, how the delta is computed. You know? There's a very uh, you know, effective uh, sequential computational algorithms. So, you know, uh, we thought that it's very simple, however, if you plug in everything, let's say you know delta in a very deep uh, you know part from here. Okay, the delta deep. It, the definition is a partial e of you know, partial and z deep, right, with the minus sign. Yeah, and if you plug in the all the recursive uh, you know uh, formulas um, to write this one explicitly, then uh, you see a uh, lots of lots of actually you know summations and also on uh, lots of Pro, you know, multiplications. So this is the original uh, error over here. And then actually, uh, you know, first uh, output uh, uh, functions uh, derivatives. And then uh, the, this guy, this guy, right? Well, what is this guy? This one is basically picks up the weight associated, associated with the um, uh, unit i and the unit j. So that's actually wij, right? So it turns out to be the long product of the um, output to function derivatives and the weight. Remember, output to function looks like uh, the, this kind of a shape of it's, you know, derivatives, right? And if we use a sinusoid, uh, uh, sigmoid function, excuse me, right? So even the one along this line takes the uh, almost a zero value, or even actually 0 0.1 for you know, one element. And actually, consecutively, you have a 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It turns out to be one thousandth. So the magnitude of this delta goes down quite rapidly, almost exponentially, as you go deeper into this. So this is a called the you know gradient vanishing problem. How we can I really deal with this issue? So there are a few effective techniques. One of them is to um, look at the um, 
other type of uh, output to function. So we started with the sigmoid function that looks like this, right? So this one is going nicely from zero to uh, one. Um, but I know as you go further, you know, this way and this way gradient is zero. So that's what we discussed in the last time. Now, instead of using that the sigmoid function, people use a different type of one so that uh, it may not vanish. Um, so one, perhaps this one is the most prevailing uh, output function. It's a rectified linear unit, uh, Ray Lu, Ray Lu, that's, that's the name of this output function. It's a simple, it's basically a linear here, um, you know, and then basically uh, just the two linear straight lines are connected at this point. Um, negative side is zero, and then positive side is linear, just in you know, a slope with the slope of one. So function is something like this, you know, max is zero and X, it would not take the negative value, okay? There are many other, you know, in clever output functions, although the difference is very small. Uh, one is that the, the, this, you know, soft plus function, um, it's a log one plus exponential X. If you take the derivatives of this, right, the log, and let's say capital X is, you know, if you take the derivatives of log cap, cap X, it's an one over cap X, right? And uh, so that, that's actually, uh, you know, one over, you know, cap X here, and then uh, D cap X DX is basically exponential X. Um, so the, this one can be written this. So, so this guy, the sigmoid function. So this function, I know sort of plus function is actually the integral of this sigmoid function. So derivatives is basically, you know, um, it's derivatives is um, sigmoid function. Um, it not, may not actually vanish in the plus side. It stays at the constant here. So this is another, you know, another you know, output function that people use. Now, um, yeah, with this, you know, it did solve the, to some extent, you know, people, I extended the number of uh, um, layers to first to five and eight and and twenty uh, some time ago. So with the um, use of uh, proper output functions and other techniques, people extended the uh, uh, depth of the neural nets. That's actually you know enabling the technology for you know studying the deep neural network. Another thing is that the architectural parameter tuning um, creating, uh, it's in, an interesting uh, the directions to pursue. So one is actually drop out the training. So surely actually a fully connected uh, multi-layer neural net having many, many you know, connections and many ways to tune is a challenge, right? So instead of directly training this, um, first, uh, we uh, just uh, cut down the half of the um, you know, neural nets. So that just like a, you know, a pandemic uh, in phase one or phase two, um, we discourage students to come to a campus, right? So we just say, you, you go home, you stay home and take a nap. You don't actually you know, uh, be you know, active. So we just invite the, the um, say your seniors, undergrad students, and then we train them, okay? So we have a fewer, you know, in a lower density and then much fewer on, you know, network connections. In fact, if you uh, shut down the 50%, the number of, um, you know, connections is 25% of the original, you know, um, fully connected ones. So actually it's easier to uh, train. So what you do is basically um, say in a, if you divide it 50, 50, um, each 50 you know, percent of the connections, um, you know, net, we train this as usual, as a, just using the back, uh, you know, back propagation. And also this part, then you know, we invite the you know, junior and, and the past, you know, um, and then uh, they, they actually uh, are trained like this. And at the end of the day, we'd like to combine these two results. So, um, yeah, you know, some of the units are being used, uh, you know, for two groups of training. If that's the case, uh, we take the um, weighted sum of the you know, weights um, over here. Um, so uh, it is prorated that, you know, by the number of um, percentage of usage. So, you know, multiple 
uh, multiply each trained weight by fraction of times uh, um, nodes was actually used during the training. So uh, if node is actually used 50% then here for training, um, uh, the result of weight W is basically, you know, um, 0.25 of that. And so we put together the, um, you know, um, prorated and weighted the sum of those and you know, weight number. And then that is to, uh, you know, replace the, uh, uh, the weights when we put them together. You know, at the end, uh, we can do some fully connected network training uh, to massage the results, but it will be more efficient than doing so from scratch. Yeah, so, so this highlights some of the benefit of not to connect all the possible units, rather we you know, focus a few connections and that is to provide some interesting results and useful results. Now that's a somewhat one of the basis for discussing convolutional neural networks, which is basically in exploiting um, uh, kind of you know, focused uh, kind of connections, not actually uh, uh, you know, going directly fully connected uh, on a network. So um, this one is particularly useful uh, in dealing with the you know image data, for instance, right? So. Um, some uh, 300 by 300 uh, uh, pixel uh, image data with RGB, you know, three channels. It uh, actually, the single image include the 270,000 pixels, right? So if you actually connected that the each um, pixel to a neural net, um, you know, input to the layers of neural nets, from that point, uh, you know, so many connections are needed. So at least the first uh, hidden layer you put in here is actually, you know, you know um, two at least 270,000 uh, times the uh, you know, number of uh, units um, is needed uh, if you make the full, you know, fully connected the network. So that's actually, even though the computer is fast, you know, but I know that's not actually feasible to do. Instead, if you look at the um, brain science literature, uh, the brain structure is somewhat very different. Um, it's that no such you know, fully connected uh, on the networks can be found, but it has a more focused connections and being made. So research on the brain suggests that an image captured at the retina is first processed locally, extracting low level the features and it's passed on to a next level where more complex features are extracted. So um, it is actually a focused connections, you know, local and you know, focused connections and having some hierarchy like this. Yeah, this neuroscience, um, brain science research um, was actually, you know, um, old one. Back 1959, uh, Fubel's you know, you know, paper is very inspiring. And inspired by that, uh, um, uh, Fukushima um, uh, proposed a uh, particular neural network, network structure. He called that uh, you know, neo cognitron. Um, you know, back 1979, uh, Fukushima is actually Kyoto University. I was actually, uh, you know, students there. Um, so I know this work to some extent. So, so that, that, that is the first actually, I know uh, in, in his paper uh, containing um, a lot of important, uh, you know, um, architectural, you know, um, structure uh, that we found in the CNN today. So that, that's actually, uh, people think this one is the basis for um, today's CNN. So, you know, we connect this selectively, locally, focusing on the particular you know, regions, right? And then after we have such actually a you know, low level, you know, um, feed, you know um, focused uh, processing, that is to uh, detect some of the basic features like uh, location of edge, the directions of edge, and, you know, that is actually connected to the next layer, which is to uh, aggregate and integrate and then abstract uh, the features and then we'll pass it on to the next level. 
And in this case, uh, actually, uh, you know, human face, uh, some lower levels, just the edge. And the next one is some part like the eyes and the nose and so, so, so forth. And at the end, it is actually integrated into the whole face for recognition. So th that's actually the basic structure. So convolution neural network you know, consists of uh, three um, major blocks. One is an input layer. Um, this is nothing but just a distributed signal to the next layer. This yellow block is very important, the feature extraction layers. Um, and then that's actually you know, having the several you know, um, steps um, and then pass it on to uh, classification layers, which consists of a fully connected uh, multi-layer neural, neural network. So the feature extraction layers are connected to specific local regions of input layer, extracting local features, and the classification layers are fully connected to multi-layer neural network producing outputs. So um, I'm so sorry to say that you know, some of the students who took uh, 2120 with me, you know, the following part, you know, following 20, past, 20 minutes, it's basically overlapping, very much overlapped with the uh, and 2120 materials, but we extend it then further. So uh, bear with me. Um, feature extraction of your convolutions. So this is actually a you know, key part of um, CNM. Um, in computer vision, the local features such as edges are detected by using spatial filters. For instance, you know, I know this is one example for spatial filter. So, you know, this is the original image. We like to detect the, uh, the kind of edge in here. So the vertical edge can be seen here, right? So the way we, uh, you know, detect that is to use uh, this kind of spatial filter, you know, um, you know, so it's a three by three matrix having some weight distributions. And uh, we take this, this one, um, and then actually mapped on top of this original image, having the uh, um, brightness distribution like this, basically signals is actually coded in the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in, in the value between zero and one, um, and actually distribution like this, right? So we take the, uh, uh, you know, weight, weighted the sum of this. So this 0.8 times this minus one, and the point to four um, multiplied by zero and the point one multiplied by one. We, we take uh, this actually, uh, you know, um, product uh, uh, summation for all the elements involved in this. And then answer is minus 2.3. So it is to uh, match how this kind of pattern or, you know, template, you know, matches and this matches um, the, uh, the local an image uh, we are examining. So the, this one is to detect the vertical line like this, and the, this template uh, or filter um, is, is actually detecting the horizontal line. So I know um, in this particular case, it's actually, I know under this one is winner. So I know mostly uh, this part is a horizontal line is actually, uh, you know, uh, embodied in here. I think this one's a little bit, you know, strange. It, it should be other way. Okay, so um, that's actually things are being done in the computer vision, and we provide this in type of a, a series of spatial filters. It's called a kernel um, to uh, do this in a matching. Now, um, this convolution is basically a correlation. Convolutional neural network uses the same local spatial filter kernel for extracting local features, okay? Um, so each segment of input array like this, you know, image pixels is convoluted uh, with a template. Um, I'll explain this a little bit, but I know um, what you see here is actually correlations, not, not the convolutions. It's kind of, you know, um, abuse of the terminology, it's being called a convolution, but it's basically a correlation. We take a, co you know, a correlation between the templates and uh, um, this you know, um, original image, okay? Just, you know, we do the same computation as we did before. The weighted sum of the input segment is computed for all the segments, 
by shifting the windows to cover all the and input the array. So we just shift this one to cover all the areas, right? The major difference from the standard spatial filter is that this, in CNN, these filters are weights of neural nets and are generated, trained through learning, training. So, you know, this computation can be done with the neural nets. Let's see how it works. So, you know, we have two, um, in this case, a two by two elements. And one is actually a filter or kernel. And these weights are basically used for synaptic uh, um, you know, weights uh, shown here. And um, in the focused area of uh, image, you know, four points over here, four pixels are fed into these uh, inputs, you know, X1 to X, X4 in this case. And then each of them is multiplied by this W and then actually uh, taking the summation. That's exactly what we did actually in the uh, computer vision case, right? So that, that actually, uh, you know, uh, correlation or convolution can be performed with the neural neurons like this, neural net. So we do this for every focused uh, local areas, right? So you know, here's the actually one neural net and one neural net, one neural net. But I know we don't need many neural nets because um, the detection of such um, you know, specific um, edge and, or um, and, you know, you know, detecting features applies to the, all the areas are shown here, right? So you know, uh, this is called the parameter sharing. Local features such as horizontal edge and corners should be found across the entire image, entire image. Right. Therefore, the same filter kernel should be used uh, everywhere. You know, so the same parameters must be shared. Right. Uh, this also implies that the, the such features are location invariant. Uh, you know, applicable to all the regions. Okay. Um, so this, you know, parameter sharing also reduces the number of parameters to train. So uh, as shown here, the previously, this one is to take care of the, this part, this one to take care of this, this one take care of this, but I know they have all, they use the same weight if the, this is to uh, detect the certain features, okay? So they or the, these weights are trained at the same time, okay? Sharing the uh, weights. Now, of course, uh, we need to actually, you know, you know um, use multiple, you know, uh, filters, edge maybe in this directions, or in this directions or oblique uh, directions or something like this. So we need the many, you know, um, um, you know uh, uh, the filters in the doing that the processing. So it corresponds to a particular uh, neurons having the particular uh, the weight distribution here and here and here. So how we can really create the many uh, um, you know, such you know, neurons are having a different uh, weights, each corresponding to a you know, specific uh, um, low level feature extraction. So, um, yeah, you know, let me just read it. Multiple filters are needed for detecting various uh, you know, local features, you know, vertical, horizontal, oblique, and blah, blah. Independent multiple neurons are used for creating, you know, multi, multiple local uh, filters, okay? Each of them is trained with the different uh, initial weights. So this is the key point. How we can create this? It's basically we assign the different initial, you know, weight values um, before training, and then if each of them start with the different uh, new weight, it is to converge to a uh, different uh, actually values. So, so we are basically in a, in a sense exploiting local minima you know, features of neural nets. So. And having that, then uh, we uh, create the uh, each actually a trained neural net that is actually covered to all the areas and then evaluate the matching with this. And then the result is stored in uh, um, another you know, place. It's called the activation map. After you activate this, you know, results are stored here. Okay. So now, as I said, you know, we need to use a different uh, um, um, you know, feature extraction neurons. 
and uh, we use that you know in our starting and training uh, starting with the diverse uh, initial weights and each of them is to you know come down to a certain um, uh, you know feature extraction um, you know filter so you know each of them is basically you know um, creates the uh, activation map so we create the stack of act activation map for every single point uh, we have uh, the, these feature points and then these are sent to the next level now let me remind you that the input two is not just uh, in, you know black and white the, the data if that's rgb you know three data actually but our direction so we basically hardwire this one to uh, this so you know we focus on um, you know, areas like this, uh, not actually connecting other areas, but I you know this area, but in this vertical direction, RGB or connected to the same uh, neurons. So that, that is the architecture used for CNN. So, you know, um, yeah, input the volumes and then stack up to two activation map, but like this, and this is the uh, low level feature extraction results. And the next one is how we can actually move up to a bigger scale. Um, the, you know, you know, that is actually detecting just in the lines and the edge and corners. We want to put them together, right? So integrate. And then somehow we need to cover the bigger areas and we need to actually suppress these small differences. Um, so we need to abstract um, and then integrate and cover the larger areas. How we really do that? And then and this is actually the second point, second major tools of CNN, it's called uh, pooling, integration and abstraction. So this is actually coming out of the, you know, low level and, you know, feature extraction layer. And it has uh, so many, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, this, uh, units like this. So we'd like to somehow integrate and, uh, uh, um, you know, simplify and then abstract the uh, key point. So one is actually, you know, and let's say uh, four, four you know, units over here can be actually integrated into one by taking the average of this value. So this uh, four by four, 16 is reduced to two by two by taking the average. Or more, we want to take the uh, more, um, you, know, you, know, you know, more key feature. Um, maybe we can just take the maximum value you know, out of these four points, which is actually max pooling uh, filter. It is to take the uh, only the maximum value to replace these in the four points by single point like this. So in the convolutional neural nets, uh, we basically do this on uh, feature mapping and you know, um, you know, pooling uh, recursively, um, you know, so, so we, we repeatedly process this one. So first layer is actually a basic feature maps and then followed by pull the feature maps. And then this one the further, um, you know, abstracted by taking the uh, next levels of feature maps followed by pulling. So uh, convolutional layer and the pulling layer are paired and repeated sometimes a few, you know, a few times or several times. Um, as, uh, as the layers proceed, the more abstract and the higher level the features are detected. Then at the final stage, we are um, um, going to the final stage. And then let me just uh, you know, move on. Um, yeah, so final stage is a classification layer. Um, so uh, it is connected to fully connected the multi-layer neural networks is going this way. And then actually we get the final results. If this one is a for say, for instance, you know, um, classifications of the image, you know, being observed, you know, maybe showing some kind of animal, is, is, is that actually a cat, the dog or a squirrel? Um, it shows um, say chances of being a cat is 80% and the dog the 10% and the squirrel maybe a 10%, you get to that kind of a um, probabilistic estimate of the object being taken. And from that, you can just, uh, you know, take the uh, most uh, biggest probability, that's a cat, then the answer is a cat, right? Uh, but to get the more actually informative uh, training, 
And we use this kind of distributions and compare that one to the right one. This is 100%, 0%, 0%. And the error is con computed uh, um, accordingly. And the back propagation is to be made. Now, the really amazing things is that uh, this error back propagation um, is made back, you know, end to end. So from the initial, um, you know, image to the uh, final stage, that's actually classified to um, say, you know, cats are classified as a dog. And using the, that kind of end-to-end -end training, you know, using the error back propagation algorithms, um, some case successfully trained this, um, yeah, the feature extraction of layers. Uh, so that is very interesting part. We don't need to actually, uh, you know, process this, you know, as an independent uh, part to, um, and uh, to train the uh, neural nets involved in the uh, feature extraction and layers, rather it is an, to be done the end to end and long process. That's a really amazing, amazing story. Um, of course, it's not actually, you know, um, you know, you know, just a blanket to cover the, everything. Um, lots of uh, tips involved, but I know some successful cases are being reported that in the end to end, it has been done. So this one is, a, and also I would say that, you know, we just assign the, um, randomly assign the initial weight to each, you know, um, you know um, units involved here. And, you know, it's boils down to a local minimum. So that's actually the feature extractions in, in here. So still challenging uh, training a deep neural net based on end-to-end -end error, error back propagation remains a challenge. Yeah, feature extraction layers uh, can be trained uh, more easily by using some of the existing uh, layers of neural nets and something is very successfully uh, applied and uh, they have trained um, low-level uh, feature extraction layer very nicely. People use that one uh, for training the other set, but uh, they use those as the initial conditions for training. So that's actually kind of a you know, uh, tip that people are using. Um, so you know, lots of uh, decisions you have to make, how many you know, um, you know, pulling uh, and then uh, convolutional layer and the pulling layers uh, need to be used. Uh, lots of uh, um, kind of you know, um, you know, tips are needed then to make that one happen. So just a summary of CNN, CNN feature extraction layers, the secret features through spatially, um, you know, local correlation to convolution um, and in a focused area or receptive field. So we do not actually do the, uh, the full connections, right? This is made possible by limiting the connectivity and then structuring the uh, network where individual units are connected only to a specific group of units. So that's a, one first point. The structure is described with the specific parameters. It's called the hyperparameters, right? So there are many of them. Um, you know, filter kernel size and the widths, the height and depth, uh, the filter count. Um, in addition to that, then I have not actually, I did not actually talk about you know, this stuff, uh, but I know stride and other, you know, you know, parameters need to be tuned. And use of CNN further requires, uh, you know, specifications as to, you know, you know, um, the max of pudding, average pudding, uh, what the sort of pudding technique you use and putting the filter size and the number of uh, altering uh, convolutional layers and the pudding layer. So that's another important thing. So lots of, you know, hyperparameters uh, need to be, you know, uh, tuned properly. So um, that's where we are. But an important thing is it has been successfully applied to uh, some of the otherwise very difficult uh, program. And uh, um, yeah, you know, um, image processing uh, applied to uh, some of the uh, self-driving cars and it's very, you know, um, competing story, but I still that this area is actually, um, you know, early stage and, uh, you know, more development is needed. Okay, now I'd like to change the gear towards the little bit more in central to uh, 2160. That's uh, time series of data analysis. And maybe I should ask, uh, stop my talk at that point and, and ask any questions. And 
Um, so one of the questions, um, Marine, how does uh, dropout training compare to the 40 connected training cases? So, um, yeah, the dropout training, it's still, it's kind of a hack. Yeah, it's kind of a hack. So sometimes yes, or sometimes no. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, people can say, and then all sorts of this, you know, um, you know, you know, showed that uh, compared to, uh, you know, fully, fully connected the neural net, you do it you know, from scratch. The, uh, the number of epochs and training uh, iterations are much, much in the lower. And then they get the, uh, you know, overall the better results. Um, of course, that depends on, at the end, how much you do, you know, so, you know, divide and conquer, we divide the big networks, right? And then train it individually. And each is a bit kind of a so-so performance, but we put them together in a clever way, as we discuss. And after that, then oftentimes people do additional training, but this additional training may be more effective because it's almost there getting closer to the, you know, um, the good ones. And also I have to say this actually, you know, kind of demo democratic you know, rules uh, um, rather than staying with the one particular one we hear broadly. So the result is more robust. Some uh, good features uh, can be obtained. But the whole neural net story, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So whether you like it, you don't like it, it's up to you. Um, to tell the truth, I don't like it, but I know <laughs> it's a, that's the na nature of the, of the uh, technologies. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, um, the um, yeah. recurrent to the network. So the, we want to deal with the time series data rather than the just you know static image and so forth, right? Uh, so and this one's more relevant to, to uh, our interest uh, dealing with the, some you know uh, evolution to time transitions. Uh, so and it being a, um, this type of neural net uh, has been applied to uh, voice recognition, the language and translations, uh, the video processing, and the word uh, compression. So you know that uh, you know on, in your browser, if you type in CNN, and then if, actually before you type, you know, stop and type in CNN the dot, it shows the dot com, right? But I know if you continue to type a CNN, N E U, then uh, your browser shows. Uh, are you talking about the CNN uh, neural network? It just uh, sh you know shows um, possible um, you know words you want to actually you know type in right. That's the word uh, completion and you know, assist. So you know no need to actually you know type in everything. That's convenient, right? So maybe you're wondering you know, you know who who did this kind of stuff? You know or why it can actually uh, predict what I'm actually um, you know typing. That comes from um, you know. Uh, recurrent neural net, RNN. So um, you've been using, you know, all the time. Now the application, the stock market, the predictions, a big one, no, or, or, you know, airline, the passenger predictions of which season, which date, and how many people are traveling. So how many actually flights must be prepared. Uh, weather forecast uh, and ocean monitoring, and maybe someone, the ocean people are working on that, right? Um, and then lots of application to, um, you know, biomedical areas, the cardiovascular monitoring and uh, when, uh, you know, heart failure is to occur, you know, what are the chances of that? And then getting some kind of trait and giving some you kind know, of warning. Or shown, shown here is actually elderly persons, you know, uh, falling, which turns out to be very dangerous and very costly um, and accident uh, uh, that the older people are facing. So if you can actually get to some kind of early trait and actually body is a little bit of sway, you can get the, uh, some predictions as to what are the chances of this particular person is to fall. Um, that prediction may be wonderful, uh, although prediction measure is more important, uh, but I know um, at least uh, if we can predict, um, you know, that kind of catastrophic uh, failure, um, it is actually good. So let's discuss this, where we actually have to deal with the time transitions. Um, so this area, the current neural network being studied by many people, many groups, 
um, uh, one of the early uh, contribution by Michael Jordan. Um, this is not a basketball story, but I know um, more serious, you know, research. Um, so output is fed back to uh, this input. So input is actually, this is the uh, pure input coming from outside, right? But uh, these actually uh, neural nets receiving the signals not only from input layers, but the one that is actually, you know, you, you know, you know produced um, an output some time ago. So usually we take a one time step uh, uh, delay. So I would say Q minus inverse is to be placing here, fed back to this. So this type of uh, you know, neural net, it is to uh, you know, use some kind of memory inside of this and then that the memory is used for the past, the memory is to use for the next um, predictions, right? So it is to capture some of the you know, time of um, cities um, transitions. Um, this particular one, um, you know, has was studied uh, uh, to some extent, but the more recent uh, uh, studies and the recurrent neural network is actually using a little different architecture, where the input is basically, um, excuse me, the feedback is not just taken from out, you know, output layer, but uh, feedback from uh, uh, hidden layers, hidden layers. Um, and, you know, started with the Edumar uh, network and also very, you know, famous NSTM and the GRU are all actually taking the feedback from uh, um, hidden units. NSTM and long, long short uh, the term memory is actually one of the most successful uh, neural networks being used. Okay, so, you know, we focus on this type of um, um, and you know the network in particular simple 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 case of Edmar network that's actually the first one uh, came out. So here uh, we consider the multi multi layer neural network. I just put this one you know upside down, not uh, horizontally but vertically. Place it vertically. Input is uh, basically bottom, and the input layer. And followed by um, hidden layer, first one, the second one, um, and then reaching the output layer, right? So input at the time t equal t is provided here, and then the next uh, after it is actually you know um, you know finished the some first uh, you know connections, then actually input t plus one is given to uh, you know um, hidden layer one, and together with the output from hidden layer one. And then you know, input to time t plus two is actually provided to this and the process here and then so on, you know, um, and then reaching the uh, you know, output. So in the case of actually, you know, um, you know voice recognitions in the first segment is putting here and then the second segment, the third segment, or this one is actually, you know, English and understanding, um, you know, first the word comes in, the second word, the third word, or first letter, second letter, third letter comes in and actually, you know, reaching the final point, okay? So, um, yeah, the, this is the you know, basic structure we'd like to consider, let me read it. In the case of hidden, um, you know, layer, neural units receive the signals from the previous hidden layer, K minus one, as well as from um, the, uh, you know, K plus, uh, T plus K, input ut plus k is a given to this, okay? Now, you know, blending both the signals, input and the you know, previous hidden layers, uh, the hidden units produce the output for the next layer until it reaches the output here, right? So you know, now this architecture has one big drawback. That is actually, if the length of time signals, you know, um, time series, is, is actually fixed, then actually we can actually set the fixed number of hidden layers like this, right? But I know we want, usually we want to deal with an input sequence having an arbitrary length, okay? And then this architecture doesn't work. So, you know, um, instead of what, do, what we do in the uh, um, a recurrent network is that the first uh, we assume that the weights used in every hidden layer, they share the same weights, 
they, they share the same weights, just like a CNN case, you know, loadable things, you know, they share the whole, um, you know, weight, right? We do that the same. So if they share the same weight, this one can be, can be rolled down, folded down to uh, this form uh, where uh, input to the air, and but th this one is actually received the time series data, t equal t, t plus one, t plus two. But every time it actually, you know, feed into this input, um, the hidden layer is actually, you know, feedback its own output to, uh, you know, to inputs. So closed loop is actually formed here. Um, the previous one is used as the, you know, additional input to the systems and actually going through this and then reaching the output there. So this is the uh, kind of a system that we deal with. Now, inside of that, we can write it this way. Um, so we have uh, input to the layers, right? So input is basically kind of a um, vectorial quantity and having, uh, you know, say I um, components, U1, U2, you know, UI, right? Sitting here at the time T equal T. And they are connected to the hidden um, units, you know. So, um, so taking some missions and actually, you know, mapped to uh, you know output through nonlinear you know functions, and um, I use the x as the uh, output uh, for the and uh, hidden units, um, and then actually reaching the output that's a y. So this may be easier notations for systems control. Input is u, internal state is x, and then output is y, right? Well, depending on the literature, they use a very different in the notation, but I, I, no, let's stay with this, okay? So now weight being used is actually connecting this input to, you know, um, input to uh, hidden layer. We, we just consider the one, one hidden layer, okay? One hidden layer as you actually fold down to this, you know, it is actually, you know, single, you know, hidden layer. Then the, the, the weights uh, is actually uh, denoted that W in Ji. So this is the weight of the you know, connections from you know, unit I to unit J in the input you know, uh, the side, okay? And then output side two, um, you know, they are basically, um, you know, uh, denoted in the same way from input I in the hidden layer and leading to uh, reaching the um, in, you know, unit to J and the output layer. This is the out, okay? So this is actually standard uh, um, multi-layer neural net. So uniqueness, the difference uh, from the standard, uh, you know, one, and they actually recur, you know, uh, recurrent neural net, RN is the following. So we have a feedback loop uh, from the, um, an output of the hidden uh, units back to uh, the, this actually unit with the one unit to time delay, okay? So I know this output is let's say X, uh, you know, two, and uh, XJ, excuse me, is basically fed back to itself and also other units like this. And then weight associated with that is denoted WJI from uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, unit uh, I to uh, other, you know, unit J, okay? So that's only the difference. And then now that this unit actually having no actually a superscript uh, and others having a superscript, you know, having no superscript, uh, these ways to represent the connections, um, you know, among the, you know, hidden, you know, units, okay? So that's the notation, is this clear? Okay, so this only this, this part is unique. Now, so for the passive computation, uh, we can do the following, right? So the, let's see, uh, you know, we like to find the first actually, you know, Z, let's see a uh, Z, J, H, you know, and unit J. This one is to receive the uh, input, you know, from here with the, you know, weight W, J, I, in, right? But also it is to collect the inputs from their hidden units outputs through this channel, right? You know, this one also create the something over here. This one also created something here, right? So that let's keep track of that. 
So we can write J H in hidden, you know, uh, you know, layer is given by from input U I times W J I in. Right. Also, don't forget that this guy, you know, feedback with the time index t minus one, because that's actually, we're talking about the time t, you know, the ones actually feeding back is, you know, t minus one, xt, because it's a, you know, hidden layers output, right, x t minus one, with the weight wjk, wjk, and then take the summation over, you know, k, which are across the all hidden units, okay? Uh, the number of uh, hidden units is a capital H. Right, the once we created this uh, J, you know, uh, the Z J H, then we take the uh, nonlinear map as uh, shown here. Right. Now output the uh, units it, it is to you know correct the uh, inputs from uh, actually a hidden layer output. So that's actually X, and the weight is used W J I, you know, out. Right, and then take the uh, nonlinear map. That's it. Now the challenge is actually you know training, so let's actually discuss that. So now I just rearrange that. You know, two um, you know neural nets uh, hidden layers are actually written in this way. So um, yeah, you know, uh, you know this path is just a standard path, but we do have the kind of transitions through uh, this uh, unit of time delay. Um, output here is to you know, um, you know, pass it on to the next uh, layer um, of the hidden uh, units over here, right? You know, doing this for every connections across this multiple time steps, it can simplify it this way. So, you know, inputs going to hidden layer, but you know, this hidden layer output, not only going to uh, its own output, but it's also, also going to uh, next, you know, time layer, um, you know, hidden layer. And actually it passes it on, pass it on to the final layer, right? So unfolding the RNN in time, and then by stacking um, the identical copies, this identical copies of the RNN and the redirecting connections, you know, you know, horizontally within the network, we can obtain the connections between, you know, subsequence you know, subsequent and the copies like this. So the reason why I drew this is for the purpose of actually, you know, um, getting the error back propagation, you know, training algorithms. So training of RN, target output training data, okay? Um, you know, basically uh, this is actually correct the teacher signals teacher signals. It's given to each output, y1, y2, y, yt. So it's given to all of this, okay? Well, it depends on the, you know, application. So sometimes um, we look at only, you know, yt, and then these are not the given. So that's actually, you know, um, sometimes happens, but, you know, um, yeah, and more general case is to provide the teacher signals to all actually outputs. And then uh, and the total performance uh, prediction error is basically uh, given by the summation of these uh, you know, squared error, these squared errors, okay? So, you know, and, and then each actually, uh, this column is called, you know, time um, layer. The row bit actually is, you know, confusing. Time layer, okay? This is the final time layer, and this is the initial time layer, okay? And then we take the summation across this all time layers, okay? Now, so, you know, how can I actually apply the error bug propagation algorithms? Unfortunately, the standard uh, error bug propagation algorithms uh, um, cannot be directly applied to RN, yeah, um, because of the, you know, feedback loop, right? But then by expanding it, you know, unfolding this one in this way, we can actually identify the path through which the signals is basically propagated. Right, so you know, um, yeah, you know. Let's look at the this final errors and then compute it here. And then this guy is first actually going to uh, the, this channel. So you know, you know, um, it is uh, actually channels. Uh, you know, for the passes are going this way. 
going this way. So backward passes two have to go, one is this way, and then the other is going this way, right? So this is exactly the one that we actually did with some, uh, you know, um, the standard uh, multi-layer neural net error back propagation algorithms, right? The point is that, you know, we need to propagate the error delta, you know, evaluated from the final, you know, point back to the every, you know, um, unit um, and where the weight must be corrected, right? We do not use this, you know, way to change, and you know, we need to change a little bit. But the you know, point is that you know, once we have a delta, and then actually input product mult multiplied with the learning rate, and that's a way to change we make, right? So the key point is is to compute the delta. Delta as a definition is this partial e or partial z with the minus sign. So how this one can be computed? So first of all, you know, E is actually an summation of this, right? So, you know, some weights in involved here, that's actually, you know, the way to change is the influence only through channels, right? So, you know, it has only one term, you know, associated with this, you know, you know y hat to t and y hat to two. So, you know, we can pick up only that part and going through this and here, you know, say weight involved in here is to be, you know, directory. Um, connected to this guy, right? And also weight actually associated with this is actually somewhat uh, coming from this and somewhat uh, coming from here. So we had to you know, add the two channels of influence. Way to change is the influence, both of this direction and in this direction. So, so it, we have to keep track of all this uh, stuff um, in formulating the error back propagation algorithm. So this one's a slightly different. It is called the back propagation through time, BPTT, good fancy name. Now let's you know, do this. You know, we have to start with the final layer, you know, but I know this one, the final time layer, final time layer, okay, the last one. I, I mean, I mean, yeah, the, this, this final layer, okay? And the T equal capital T, the final layer. And, and then looking at this, you know, the you know um, weights involved in here, the weights involved here. Actually, I explicitly explicitly wrote it in this way. So uh, for the path going this and this, right? So we had to keep track of that. So um, we start with the final time layer at capital T, uh, where output to Y T is directory provided, right? So this is the correct signals is given directory. So output units uh, in time capital T can be computed the directory, right? So, you know, this is the difference between predicted and the correct one. And the times the, uh, you know, derivatives of the output uh, units involved in here, the, that is something we need to do, you know, final an output layer. And actually, you know, one layer back in this direction is going to a hidden layer and uh, uh, weights, I know connecting this to this is basically WJI out. And we need to collect the delta involved in here. The delta has been actually, you know, all the delta involved in, um, in the units involved in this after layer has been computed this way. So uh, this is not just the one, but many of them, uh, the delta JO has been actually identified here. And uh, um, looking at the delta here, we have to collect all these, you know, delta O, J, right? So that is actually shown here, you know. So this one is to collect, uh, say, uh, delta J, O with this weight, the W, J, I out, right? And then uh, multiply on uh, this output, uh, you know, G prime, Z, I. So this is exactly the same as we have seen in the, uh, you know, standard error bug propagations for this part. Now, a little the tricky part is actually as we go to a little bit earlier time, uh, you know, layer. So T minus one or T minus two and earlier layer. You have to remember that the, you know, um, weight and change here is to influence the lesser part in through two channels. One is this way, the other is this channels, right? So, you know, final performance is actually um, influenced by the weight change here. So we have to look at that in both. Uh, on the other hand, this in you know, the output uh, unit here is, 
you know, influence, the, the change in here is the influence only this channel. So that's a simple, you know, output uh, is basically computed here directly, and then, uh, then multiplied by this, you know, G prime, right? But, you know, this guy, hidden layers, the way to change in the delta, excuse me, is actually influencing both uh, the directions. So we have to collect the, uh, you know, influence from both channels. So one is actually, you know, you know out this way. So a bunch of deltas involved, and we have to collect that uh, with this and weight WJI out is involved in here. And this one is something unique. It comes from the next uh, uh, time layer. So that's actually T plus one. Deltas involved in the next time layer, delta T plus one must be fed in and uh, you know, weight must be you know, used W you know, LI associated with this connection and then take a summation. And then finally, it is to be multiplied by the uh, output uh, derivatives of that uh, particular I know, I know, uh, unit. So this is it. So um, yeah, the delta can be computed in, in a very similar way to the you know, standard multi-layer neural net, okay? Um, now, when we actually talk about the weight change, weight changes, uh, remember that the all you know time layers the weights are shared, so we do not do this you know change this one individually, but you know all of them must be changed you know um, as a whole. So and actually input two it must be changed as a whole, right? So input the uh, you know, stuff, um, you know, we actually you know multiplied the uh, delta. And the input to it is basically, you know, uh, you know, directory input is a UI and the delta J. Also, you know, associated with this is basically this. This weight is basically, you know, from um, input I to uh, a hidden layer uh, unit to J. And then that delta J is collected from this hidden layers, right? And then we take the summation T equal one to uh, T because, you know, these weights are shared. So it is not only a good for this particular time layer, but it must be good for others. So why not actually, uh, you know, correcting and then taking some kind of average of these actually, you know, um, you know weight change and then use that one um, for the all the weight change involved in here. So we just uh, take the uh, summation of the, you know, uh, corrections to be made at the, all the time layers. Likewise, this actually hidden layers, you know, the input uh, associated with this WJI, this actually input the I is coming from some other hidden layers, right? And actually, I know um, it is and coming from the previous one, input side the previous one. So XI T minus one must be used. And then actually, I know hidden layers, so the delta, you know, unit has this delta, delta J, multiply this with the uh, learning rate. Output is doing the same thing. Okay, so this is actually you know the basic structure of the um, you know uh, back propagation through time. Of course, this one has a big drawback because because as the time um, the layers extend large t, large t, the error back propagation through time tends to vanish. That's the same problem, right? There are a few techniques and the network uh, architectures uh, that is to uh, alleviate this problem have been um, uh, proposed and uh, proven to be very effective, you know, to cope with the um, gradient, uh, you know, vanishing problem, right? So one of the uh, very famous, uh, and, you know, architecture and then technique is called the long short term memory, LSTM, um, which has been used quite extensively. And uh, I have no time to uh, talk about it, unfortunately, but it's just, you know, an essence. And this one is a clever in a few points, um, short term, long, uh, long short term memory network architecture. Um, it has more control over information transmitted. And actually, you know, it discards some of the irrelevant information coming from the previous, uh, you know, time step that basically, you know, shut down. And then it actually it has, a, and, it, and, the, and the decision is made based on the new coming in, input signals. 
and then it carried over signals um, uh, that decide whether the uh, signals coming from this is to be discarded or passed on. And this uh, X mark is basically, um, you know, um, and determine, uh, you know, um, go through or actually, you know, discard to forget. Also, uh, incoming signals together with the previous uh, the histories, and it is determined in some of the info in important uh, useful information to retain, and then that is actually you know added to this to uh, to be transferred to the next stage. And also, an output side is actually created separately, and uh, you know this you know output to be presented versus the signals just transmitted to the next one is separated. And then that's actually a clever idea because you know uh, it is useful for coping with the vanishing the gradient the problem. So it it actually uh, uses the two signals to transmit from uh, units to unit. And then the top top actual signal. This one is very useful because there's no actually diminishing signals along this line. It's called the uninterrupted highway coming into this. So that's actually useful signals that are being used. So um, just a reflections of today's lecture, I know strong points of deep neural nets, um, error back propagations with the improved activation functions. That's actually a clever techniques and like uh, ReLU is actually uh, useful for actually, I know, I know coping with the um, diminishing problem and also LSTM as I explained, it has a better technique. So automatic feature extraction through end-to-end -end learning, CNN, this is really amazing part. And otherwise, and people in the computer vision field, and they have to you know, put together, you know, handcraft the you know, feature extraction um, you know, filters. Uh, instead, this is data-driven, right? And the forecast connections and the hierarchical structure is really actually you know, one very important concept to make that happen. And the capturing of the time series information, RN did it to some extent, and that's a really actually amazing things, right? And we also have some uh, amazing, clever ideas, but uh, not so much, you know, rigorous, you know, early stopping for preventing overfitting. It's a good tip, but I, we don't know whether that is actually useful in, in other general tools. And a lot of lots of hacks involved in you know, a dropout uh, momentum uh, randomized weights for getting rid of uh, um, local minimum and adult data augmentations and lots of hacks involved, right? Altering uh, convolutions and pooling. Uh, uh, this part is actually needing a lot of try and error um, you know, efforts. In the bottom line, unfortunately, is really the lack of a fundamental theory and uh, more importantly, perhaps uh, after you trained it, do you learn anything from that? Maybe we learn something, but I know the results versus uh, the, the um, weight trained, weight values, it doesn't actually explain why that is uh, working well or it doesn't work. So the lack of accountability is actually a major drawback of the in the neural net in particular, you know, deep neural nets. So I don't know how you actually treat this, you know, areas, you know, perhaps uh, what you need to do is, you know, this method is absolutely useful, absolutely useful, but um, we have to use it uh, with care. So um, yeah, always I, I studied this uh, and prepared for the 2160 lectures. I got the uh, some actually positive feeling and then kind of you know, weird uh, kind of uh, disappointing uh, you know, feeling, uh, always a mixture of these two. But I know it's being proven as absolutely useful. So you know, most important is for us to be able to use it carefully and then actually find the best you know, right way, effective way of using you know, these tools. And certainly it is expand the kind of tools that we can use. So, um, you know, that's all I, I can say. Now, lots of questions. Um, due to feedback, uh, does that mean that you can only get an output after some initial input? 
okay okay maybe um yeah um yeah the turn you are talking about the uh, you know michael jordan's uh, output to uh, feedback uh, stuff right so so feedback has been taken from various places so uh, you know hidden layers is actually more um you know studied and you know uh, produce the uh, very useful results so you know I would say that the I just talk about the very small set of an architecture. There are so many different architectures, and but you know, oftentimes it do not did not work. Yeah, did not work. Some carefully crafted the stuff like a LSTM that actually works beautifully for classical program. But I know um, this is a tough question. And Blake, this approach seems remarkably similar to Arumax. Oh. In that the output is, uh, we did some of the output. Yeah, that's interesting point to break. And so, yeah, you know, in fact, it's, it's you know, auto regressive part is involved, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I you know that's actually the right to framework uh, for linear systems, <laughs> linear systems. But now going to uh, um, nonlinear systems, uh, and uh, we do need the new tools, the new methods, and it's a totally different uh, actually stuff, right? Yeah, but by the way, you know, uh, I said just the you know, linear and the nonlinear are very totally different, but I know um, the last two lectures are dealing with the ways of uh, integrating, um, you know, linear and nonlinear. So that may be a one you know, direction to, to answer to your questions. Yeah, but I know, um, yeah, this kind of you know, information processing areas uh, for a long time, it's been just uh, static uh, in information processing. Uh, it is rather new that the community is paying attention to uh, time sequence data. Well, maybe a voice recognition is actually one of the key things and they, they have to really look at that. But uh, now as things are expanded to uh, time series of the data analysis, the applications is just expanded dramatically. And then not just in a you know conventional computer science oriented uh, the problems like uh, image processing, but also some other physical systems, which is actually you know um, you know you know you know evolution you know time evolution is central and in many of the engineering programs. So I, I expect that the uh, this you know RNN is one of the uh, you know uh, connections between something dealing with the differential you know. Uh, the, you know, uh, the different equations that we have been doing, um, and then the machine learning or something, you know, that being done, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it, you know, it, the big, you know, waves are kind of having uh, in that area, uh, the way to combine these two. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to finish it. And then actually, you know, um, I don't have to teach you for 10 days. Great. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it too much. And actually, you know, uh, COP, you know, discussion is scheduled this Friday. So please attend that. And then someone uh, reporting that uh, will actually give the interesting uh, conversation. So neural net is actually lots of, uh, you know, uh, discussions. Um, and needed. So please share your your experience. You know, treating the you know many of the uh, you know hyperparameters, that you get to something interesting result. So, okay, have a happy uh, Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.